tell me what. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's Senate occasional lecture. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where we meet and pay respect to all Indigenous elders, past and present. Well, today we are having the, the lecture we would like to have had in NAIDOC week, but it's, having it two weeks later is, is uh, just as good because it's a great pleasure today to introduce to you Leah Armstrong to speak about reconciliation action plans. Now, in this building in particular, we've followed for many, many years the the, um, no, I won't say saga, but the history and the journey towards reconciliation. We've had many committee inquiries. We've had a, a joint select committee on um, reconciliation, and I can see some former staff of that committee in the audience. We've, we've had some marathon debates, including on major landmark legislation, such as the Native Title Bill, 1993 and, and later amendments to the Native Title Act. Um, but, but of course, while most Australians support the journey towards reconciliation w w without demur, uh, th th there also has to be a practical dimension. It's all very well to change our constitution or to do things at a very high level, but reconciliation is also a practical thing. And uh, over the past decade or so, the idea of reconciliation action plans has uh, be become um, part, of, part of our uh, outlook. And uh, two weeks ago today, the parliamentary departments launched our second reconciliation action plan, which for those of you who are interested, you can find it on our website. And um, it's our second plan. And, and it goes through uh, the range of measures that, that we as parliamentary departments are engaged in to further the cause of practical reconciliation. But you haven't come here to hear from me, you have come here to hear from our guest today. And so it's with very great pleasure that I introduce Leah Armstrong. Leah was the um, CEO of Reconciliation Australia from 2010 to 2014. I should have started by telling you that she's a Torres Strait Islander woman born in Mackay, New uh, Queensland. And uh, she was recently appointed chair of both Supply Nation and the New South Wales Aboriginal Housing Office boards. She serves on a number of boards and other uh, governance bodies, including the Senate of the University of Sydney. So please join me in welcoming today Leah Armstrong to speak about reconciliation action plans, creating shared value. Thank you very much, Rosemary, for that introduction. Kapu um, Tang, greetings to you all today in the language of my ancestors from the island of Boigu in the Torres Strait. Um, as is custom, I too would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land, to their elders past and present, the Ngunnawal people. And in doing so, I acknowledge their continuing contribution and connection to this land. The acknowledgement of the traditional owners of this land is an essential part of the changes that we have seen in contemporary Australia as part of our national efforts towards reconciliation. And in the spirit of reconciliation, I would like to acknowledge the non-Indigenous visitors here today. It is a pleasure to be with you, and I would like to thank Rosemary and the Senate Office for extending the invitation to speak. The context of my speech draws on my experience as a pragmatic practitioner with more than 25 years involvement in the reconciliation movement. At a local level from the early 90s in Newcastle with the group called Yarantine Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Corporation, who was engaged by the Council for Ab Aboriginal Reconciliation to conduct community engagement and reconciliation education programs. Yarantine's vision was to become economically independent and become full free agents in our own development. A key foundation of our success was the building of respectful relationships between non-Indigenous Australians and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. Then, as Rosemary has said, at the national level, as the CEO of Reconciliation Australia, 
I was closely involved in the development, promotion and evaluation of the Reconciliation Action Plan, which is a framework to change attitudes. The program grew quite significantly during this period from 150 RAPs to over 500 RAPs. Today, reconciliation is being talked about a lot around the community. But reconciliation can mean different things to different people. It can be a very frustrating process and many have walked away from it in the search of simple solutions or a silver bullet that can promise an end to disparity and suffering. At its core, reconciliation is about building respectful relationships between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and other Australians to enable us to work together to close the gaps and to, share a sh and to create a shared sense of fairness and justice. Reconciliation has no meaning if it isn't aimed at achieving equality in life expectancy, ed education, employment, and all the important measurable areas of disadvantage. It has no meaning while some of us continue to experience racism and don't receive the same treatment before the law as the majority of Australians. We cannot think of a reconciled Australia while there continues to be such profound disparity between us. Fifteen years after the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation presented the Australian Declaration towards Reconciliation, Reconciliation Australia has released their inaugural State of Reconciliation report. The research in the report examined reconciliation in Australia and internationally and identified five critical dimensions that together represent a comprehensive picture of reconciliation. To be truly reconciled, we must have good race relations, where all Australians understand and value Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and non-Indigenous cultures, rights and experiences, which result in greater relationships based on trust and respect and that are free of racism. There must be equality and equity for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to participate equally in a range of life opportunities and the unique rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are recognised and upheld. Australian political, business and community institutions must actively support reconciliation. We have a united Australian society that values and recognises Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and heritage as a proud part of our shared identity. And finally, there must be historical acceptances by all Australians who understand and accept the wrongs of the past and the impact of these wrongs. Australia makes amends for the wrongs of the past and ensures that these wrongs are never repeated. The report states clearly that reconciliation is no longer seen as a simple issue or a single agenda. The concept of reconciliation has taken a holistic approach that encompasses rights as well as so-called symbolic and practical approaches. Australia has developed a strong foundation for reconciliation, but acknowledges the mixed results across the dimensions and we have a long way to go. It highlights that 86% of Australians believe the relationship between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and other Australians is important. But Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people still experience high levels of racial prejudice and discrimination. Reconciliation has raised broader questions about our national identity and the place of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories, cultures and rights in our nation's story. Most Australians believe Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures are important to Australia's identity, but only 30% are knowledgeable about our histories and cultures. 94% of Australians agree that the wrongs towards Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people occurred as a result of European settlement, 
However, Australians are divided on the nature and extent of the effect of the past wrongs and have varying views on forgiveness and attitudes to moving on. On the national political scale, reconciliation appears to be at an all-time high with multi-partisan support. However, progress in closing the gaps on Indigenous disadvantage is slow and in some cases is going backwards. The suffering is far from over and the gaps remain. But 25 years after the modern movement began, we are seeing real progress and record potential to achieve more. The positive progress in our nation's reconciliation journey is the goodwill coupled with the practical measures being undertaken in workplaces and businesses across Australia. Whilst these various government efforts on the policy front are mixed, broad support for reconciliation in the business and community sector, sectors have grown significantly over the past 10 years. Today, there are 650 business and community organisations with reconciliation action plans, and a further 600 schools and early childhood learning centres are involved in the RAP program. These businesses and schools are creating environments that foster a high level of knowledge and pride in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories, cultures and contributions to increase respect, reduce prejudice and strengthen relationships between the wider Australian community and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Reconciliation action plans were set up to mark the 40th anniversary of the 1967 referendum and began with eight organisations. Yantin was the only Indigenous organisation among these trailblazers, which included groups like the ANZ Bank, BHP Billiton and Oxfam. Now over a thousand organisations are involved in the RAP program which covers about 20% of the national work workforce and is growing by the day. The RAP program is one of the largest of its kind in Australia and possibly the world. Reconciliation Australia gathers data from the RAP community annually and there is strong evidence that RAPs are making a significant contribution to closing the gaps in disparity in education, employment and health. The 2015 data indicates that RAP organisations employ over 35,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. They have provided cultural awareness training to 262,000 employees. They've provided more than $77 million for educational scholarships. And they've provided $100 million in pro bono support to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. RAP organisations have formed more than 3,900 partnerships with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations, and they have bought goods and services worth 32 million from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander certified businesses. This increase by Corporate Australia investing in First Australians has businesses more confidently citing both the social and business benefits to give context for further investments relating to closing the gap. We see boardroom discussions on these matters shift from philanthropic perspectives that emerge when times are good to long-term sustainable activities which are outcome focused and benefits companies in several ways. And as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations accumulate greater assets and more Indigenous students graduate from university and the demand for labour at the local, region and remote areas increases, as well as government policies that strengthen procurement with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander businesses and increased employment targets, the Australian corporate sector is looking to strategies that deliver shared value. If you, for many, maybe the concept of shared value is new, and it is defined, has been defined by Professor Michael Porter 
and Mark Kramer from Harvard in that it involves creating economic value in a way that also creates value for society by addressing its needs and challenges. Shared value is not social responsibility or philanthropy, but a new way to achieve economic success. It is not on the margins of what companies do, but at the center. It defines the policies and practices that enhance the competitiveness of a company while simultaneously advancing the economic and social conditions in the community in which it operates. Porter and Kramer identified three ways in which shared value can be created. Firstly, reconceiving products and markets. Defining markets in terms of unmet needs or social ills and developing profitable products and services that remedy these conditions. Redefining productivity in the value chain. Increasing the productivity of the company or its suppliers by addressing the social and environmental constraints in, that, in its value chain. And local cluster development. Strengthening the competitive context in key regions where the company operates in ways that contribute to the growth and productivity. Creating shared value goes beyond corporate social responsibility in guiding the investments of companies in their communities. Corporate social responsibility focuses mostly on reputation and have only a limited connection to the business, making them hard to justify and maintain over the long run. Creating shared value is integral to a company's profitability and competitive position. It has a profit imperative. It leverages the unique resources and expertise of the company to create economic value by creating social value. Shared value creation is about being good, not just looking good. The Reconciliation Action Plan program provides a framework and plan for companies to articulate their shared value strategy. The goal of a RAP is to turn good intentions into measurable actions that support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander achieve equality in all aspects of life, a goal which benefits all Australians. The RAP provides a framework which covers the activities that we know can make a difference. Good relationships that are based on trust, understanding, communication and mutual respect. Respecting the special contribution of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to Australia. And working together to ensure Indigenous children have the same life opportunities as other children in this prosperous country. But a RAP is most successful when it is supported by a strong business case. When directors and CEOs of the RAP companies are able to identify and articulate the business benefits to engaging in reconciliation. Similar to shared value, there are four key areas which underpin the business case. Access to new and improved market share and employing a workforce that is representative of the community. Organisations that are developing new markets and better penetrating existing markets by more fully, fully meeting the needs of the fastest growing population of Australia, the Indigenous population, helps to develop trust and better engages Indigenous customers. The National Bank of Australia is a great example. NAB launched its Reconciliation Action Plan in 2008 and have made significant investments and commitments in promoting financial inclusion by, by providing greater access to financial products and services, providing access to opportunities that lead to real jobs and meaningful careers in banking, and building partnerships that enable Indigenous businesses to grow and prosper. By investing in these areas, NAB recognises that greater financial inclusion increased personal and household income and the growing Indigenous business and organisational wealth will lead to greater interaction with the financial services and position NAB as a banker of choice for Indigenous Australians. 
Workforce efficiency is a key business imperative. Attracting, motivating and developing talented local staff connected to local communities is efficient and effective. This overcomes costs and challenges associated with recruiting, transporting and accommodating staff from other locations and the higher turnover rate of these positions. As a part of their commitment to increasing the participation of Indigenous peoples in their businesses, Broad Spectrum, formerly known as Transfield, launched their first RAP in 2009. They have learnt the value of community engagement and the impact of meaningful employment at the community and local level. By supporting local people, Broad Spectrum has generated a positive reputation among the community it works. Their business model is based on long-term relationships, a value it takes to any community they engage with. As a business, a local workforce has clear financial benefits, but in addition, they are supporting the social footprint of the community. Staff recruitment, engagement and satisfaction. Generation Y clearly have a greater connection to social and corporate responsibility and make this a day-to-day -day part of their lives. Graduates are increasingly aware of and in interested in social responsibility of their employers and want the opportunity to play a meaningful role through their work workplaces. Maintaining staff well-being and satisfaction by providing opportunities to engage with community projects is a key workforce attraction. KPMG is deeply respected by their Indigenous partners and the business community when it comes to reconciliation. They recognise there is an important value proposition that they can off offer to attract new graduates and retain employees. And they want to develop leaders who have out of the box experiences. Participating in mentoring programs Honorary work and secondments enables their staff to progress their professional and personal development. KPMG supports leadership potential, skills transfer, performance, confidence and maturity, which aligns strongly with their global values and behaviours. And finally, improving supply chain diversity. Purchasing choices are and increasingly will be influenced by the organisation's reputation and community orientation. Indigenous procurement is a key action in reconciliation action plans. The Australian Tax Office realised a number of years ago that it could leverage its purchasing power to create positive social impact for Indigenous business owners and the communities. The concept to them was clear. By purchasing from Indigenous businesses, the ATO can grow the personal wealth of Indigenous owners and employees, can build capacity and stoke innovation in their supply chain. Since 2014, the ATO has progressively developed its supply diversity strategy and in 2016 have procured over $26 million in goods and services from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander businesses. RAPs are also offering Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations and people new ways of understanding and engaging with reconciliation as advisors, as co-mentors, training providers and enterprise partners, as well as benefiting from greater numbers of more carefully considered employment and professional development opportunities. The State of Reconciliation report highlights that businesses are not just creating employment opportunities for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workers and shared value to their companies. They are creating a cultural change through the awareness raising and leadership. They are leading changes in attitudes, remoulding the culture in the thousands of workplaces and increasing the understanding of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history and culture. They are actively breaking down racist stereotypes and helping to shape or create workplaces which are supportive and encouraging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander employees. Reconciliation Australia's survey of employees in RAP organisations found 
that compared to the general community, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workers and other employees in RAP organisations have much higher levels of trust between each other. They are far less prejudiced towards each other and have greater pride in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. But as we have experienced in the past two years, the general community's outcry to the Indigenous War Dance Gold celebration by Indigenous role model and leader Adam Goods, an Australian of the Year and most decorated AFL player, and the lecture guide produced by the University of New South Wales to replace the word settlement to invasion. We have a long way to go in changing attitudes and building a nation that respects Indigenous cultures and accepts our history. So how can governments create shared value? Porter and Kramer suggest that governments and not-for-profit organisations would also be able to leverage the power of market-based competition in addressing social problems. Shared value offers a strategic opportunity to form exciting and innovative multi-stakeholder partnerships between government, business and civil society that are effective, efficient and impactful. They found that government can play five key roles in accelerating the adop adoption and implementation of shared value. First, acting as a knowledge broker, investing in social research, analysing best practices for solving problems and strengthening technical research that complements companies and community efforts. Convening key players, a valuable first step for government in encouraging the identification and development of shared value opportunities is to convene key players together. They can serve as an operating partner. Partnering with companies in the implementation of shared value strategies by adjusting existing programs and coordinating different programs of government. Changing the risk reward profile, where investment risks may appear too uncertain for companies, government can consider different tools like loans, tax breaks and subsidies to improve the risk reward profile and creating a supporting regulatory environment. A more nuanced regulation may be necessary so as not to limit potential of shared value creation. Social Ventures Australia also suggests government needs to recognise that there are multiple opportunities to encourage companies to address social issues, ranging from employment to affordable housing across all sectors and industries. This requires policies that help shape a more conducive environment for change to be sustainable and scalable. This, I believe, has been demonstrated through the Indigenous procurement policy. Governments themselves are huge purchasers of services, and by building a shared value component into their requirements, they can encourage companies to move this way. The federal government launched the revised Indigenous procurement policy in July 2015. The primary purpose of the policy is to stimulate Indigenous entrepreneurship and business development, providing Indigenous Australians with more opportunities to participate in the economy. The IPP allows Commonwealth buyers to purchase directly from Indigenous small to medium enterprises for contracts of any size and value using the Indigenous business exemption. This provides Indigenous businesses with a big advantage. They do not need to complete costly tender processes. But Indigenous businesses must still demonstrate value for money. But this can be done with through simpler processes. The policy has three key components. A 3% target by 2020 for purchasing from Indigenous enterprises. A mandatory set aside to direct some Commonwealth contracts to Indigenous enterprises and a minimum Indigenous participation requirement for certain Commonwealth contracts. Since beginning in July 2015, Commonwealth agencies in 11 months have exceeded their target of 0.05% 
and awarded 993 contracts to 282 Indigenous businesses with a total value of more than $195 million. This is more than 31 times the value of Commonwealth procurement with Indigenous businesses in 2013, was, which was just at $6.2 million. One of the leading Commonwealth agencies to embrace the IPP is the Department of Defence. The Department of Defence has been working with Indigenous contractors for some years, but the policy has enabled them to use an exemption under the IPP to sign a $6 million contract, the first for an Australian contract, with Pacific Services Group, an Indigenous business, as the head contractor for works which will refurbish existing marine infrastructure and buildings in Sydney. The IPP is a good news exception in Indigenous policy, and the flow-on effect that is now being witnessed with state and territory governments and the corporate sector adopting similar policies will only accelerate its impact. The policy is creating shared value through government diversifying their supply chain, which brings innovation, with Indigenous businesses being more profitable and are 100 times more likely to employ Indigenous people, which increases tax revenue and less reliance on government social services. A key partner in the implementation of the policy is Supply Nation, a national not-for-profit organisation established to accelerate supply diversity in Australia and grow a prosperous Indigenous business sector. Supply Nation's goal is to integrate Indigenous small and medium enterprises into the supply chains of Australian corporate and government agencies. Today, Supply Nation has over 1,000 registered and certified Indigenous businesses and 230 government and corporate members. Supply Nation works on a national, global, cross-sectorial scale in a manner that is driven by corporate and government buyers. Supply Nation has outperformed its global link partners, the Canadian Aboriginal Minority Supply Council, the Minority Supply Development Council in the UK and the South Australian Supply Development Council, as well as the Minority Supply Development Council in China. In 2015, Supply Nation released a report, The Sleeping Giant, on the social return on investment of Supply Nation certified Indigenous businesses. The researchers found that every certified supply owner uses their business as a vehicle to drive change for their family and their communities. Owners and employees of these certified supply businesses spoke of their increased confidence, autonomy and aspirations. They emphasised their commitment to make the businesses work for the wider community. All of these Indigenous business owners expressed their pride in being an example of strength and independence for the next generation. Business owners invest in their children's education. They act as mentors for their employees and other Indigenous businesses, and are positive role models in the community. Factors they themselves attribute directly to owning their own business. Some of the other key outcomes identified in the report were for every dollar of revenue that certified suppliers created, $4.41 of economic value is then created. Indigenous businesses employ more than 30 times the proportion of Indigenous people than other businesses. Indigenous owned businesses strengthen their Indigenous employees' connection to culture. And the owners of Indigenous businesses reinvest revenue in their communities. Supply Nation, the Commonwealth agencies through the Indigenous procurement policy, and Corporate Australia are demonstrating what can be achieved through a shared value approach. We need more examples of this policy approach. What will be important going forward, though, is to identify the policies that are the most effective in achieving the intended result of social and economic value. 
One such policy is the Indigenous Advancement Strategy. In response to desperate situations, well-intended people are seeking solutions by highlighting the dysfunction and dependency within Indigenous communities. And as a consequence, there is an overwhelming negative image. These negative images often convey only part of the truth, but they are not regarded as part of the truth. They are being regarded as the whole truth. And once accepted as the truth about communities, this deficit model determines how problems are to be addressed. It begins by focusing on a community's deficiencies and problems and is by far the most travelled path by governments and com commands the vast majority of our financial and human resources. In my mind, the focus on this approach has been inappropriate evidence base for the current policy framework on welfare reform for the past 10 years. The current policy framework fo focuses on solutions that are prescriptive, that are based on problems and deficits and focus on government is on directive and reactive or interventionist. They are punitive. The actions and implementation is driven by a stick approach with compliance audits and statutory reviews with quarantining of welfare payments. And the role of government is, has become on policing and surveillance of people and the outcomes rather than being a partner in the performance of the pro process. As a result, many disadvantaged communities are now environments of services, where behaviours are affected because residents come to believe that their well-being depends on being a client. They begin to see themselves as people with special needs that can only be met by outsiders. By comparison, I believe there is an alternative path, which insists on establishing a clear commitment to discovering a community's capacities and assets and opportunities. That is to locate all the available local assets to begin connecting them with one another in ways that multiply their power and effectiveness. And to begin harnessing local institutions and decision-making authority for local development purposes. This requires governments to adopt a role, adopt a role that looks for opportunities to harness the creativity, perseverance and resources of the community and the private sector to create shared value. This approach is recognised by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. In the policy approach, it is adopting and engaging the private sector in foreign aid and development. DFAT's recent ministerial statement, Creating Shared Value Through Partnership, demonstrates its intention to fulfil this role. DFAT intends to amplify the impact of Australia's aid program through moving away from aid grants to leveraging the assets, connections, creativity and expertise of the private sector in such a way that it generates business returns. The program aims to solve complex development problems across a number of priorities, including agriculture, fisheries and water, building resilience and building effective governance across education and health and gender equality issues. DFAT's value proposition is to offer corporate and community businesses the ability to convene, broker and influence. DFAT have considerable networks and credibility to assist businesses. They have deep knowledge of the business, political and regulatory environment in the developing countries. They support in creating a more attractive business operating environment by policy reform and their investments are specifically related to improving investment environment in the countries they work. And they have the capability to provide catalytic funding to encourage and support businesses. Government and community groups will need to constantly reassess how they can optimise what they do to contribute to the creation of shared value. This requires aligned interests, a common direction 
and an environment that is conducive to advancing everybody's efforts. RAPS, or Reconciliation Action Plans, are already providing a framework for this approach, with community and corporate businesses already creating shared value. There are already 20 companies that have achieved the highest Elevate RAP status, which is awarded by Reconciliation Australia when companies demonstrate significant investment and thought leadership. Governments need to capitalise on this and become a partner in the outcome. One such area which I believe offers significant opportunities for creating shared value is in early childhood education. The Commonwealth has set a new closing the gap target of 95% of all Indigenous four-year-olds enrolled in early childhood education by 2025. Evidence shows that the quality early childhood education prepares a child for school, has an impact, a positive impact on attendance, and provides a solid foundation for learning and achieving at school and beyond. This is particularly important to vulnerable Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. The government is aiming to invest $40 billion in childcare support through the Jobs for Families childcare package which includes targeted support for vulnerable children and families. In addition, a further 10 million is being invested for integrated early childhood, maternal and child health and family support services with a number of disadvantaged communities. According to the National Voice, the Secretariat for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Child Care, SNAKE, the Jobs for Family Care package may not achieve its intended outcome for more than 19,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. And there is strong evidence that the community that supports the importance of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community control to outcomes in service delivery. What works is community engagement, ownership and control over particular programs and interventions. SNAKE advocates that Indigenous early childhood education centres support the well-being of the most vulnerable children and families in the community. They are holistic and responsive to child and family needs, inter including integrating language development, speech and hearing supports, as well as broader health, family support, capacity building and early intervention. They are Indigenous-led and support local employment and upskilling in the community. Corporate Australia also recognises the importance of early childhood education, with Australia's largest oil and gas company, Woodside, announcing a partnership with the University of Western Australia's Centre for Social Impact to invest $20 million over 10 years into early childhood development in communities where Woodside operates. In doing this, they are investing to reduce vulnerability, increase resilience and capacity in communities. Now, in order to foster robust and sustainable workforces in communities from 2025 and beyond. The initiative partners with early childhood experts to improve health, nutrition, safety and education for children aged zero to eight years. Woodside launched their 2016 Elevate Wrap and have committed to improving early childhood outcomes for Indigenous Australian children and families through the Woodside Development Fund. No single individual, program, organisation, institution, company or government can bring about large-scale social improvement alone. The alignment of the three sectors with a commitment to build strong relationships and partnerships, respecting each partner's role and matching strengths and capabilities, and efforts to enable the local Indigenous community to be the owner and driver of their services, would deliver educational opportunities and outcomes greater than would be otherwise achieved without collaboration. Delivering shared value for all. Reconciliation 
can seem a big process. And many Australians don't know how to take action. But it is the small everyday acts which all Australians can get involved. It can involve actions by individuals, such as att attending an Indigenous cultural event, acknowledging the traditional owners, standing up against racism, reading a book by an Indigenous author, or it can involve actions by businesses to purchase products from Indigenous owned businesses or employ Indigenous people. When reconciliation becomes a natural process, which is not spoken about, but is displayed daily within every action between individuals and groups, then we can achieve greater equality. When we work together, shoulder to shoulder, we bring a greater understanding of each other. When I reflect on what reconciliation is for me, it is more than a process or a movement. It's a philosophy. It is about, it's about accepting difference, cultural differences, differences in experiences and viewpoints and opinions. It's about building respectful relationships and working towards a just society for all. It is essential nation building effort. It encourages us all to be better selves. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Leah. It's a, such an impressive story. And uh, I think it's so uplifting to have an alternative model to the really you know, negative, depressive wealth, welfare uh, model that you, I think you described really well and just called it the deficit model. Um, I, I'd like to invite questions or comments from the, the audience, uh, yes, but, but first of all, I, I'd like to um, just perhaps float one idea for you to, to comment on. Um, and that is that, you know, it's such a big picture, such large aspirations, but action starts on the ground with that first step. And I think one of the important concepts of the, the Reconciliation Action Plans uh, is the idea of a rap champion. You know, you, you need perhaps an, th those individuals with, with vision and commitment to take those first steps. And I wonder if you care to, to comment about that concept of a, a rap champion and how important they might be in, in this whole process. Yeah. Um, as I sort of outlined, raps are really about institutional change. And, um, but, you know, reconciliation needs to live, live in the hearts and minds of every Australian. So that's, you know, those small steps individuals can take very small. So it doesn't, you know, the big picture doesn't have to be so scary. I think that's what we need to break down is that, yes, reconciliation is a big, big picture and nation building agenda, but it takes the individual acts of every individual Australian. Um, so for wraps in an institutional context, yes, it does require someone to kind of take a, a sort of a leading champion role. And that, you know, that generally, and it has to be long term as well. Um, once they get it sort of at the, um, the, the board level and the CEO level, they have to commit, it has to actually come from the top as well. Where we see the resistance mostly in institutions is not so much at the top or the bottom in the organisations, it's actually the middle piece. So that's where the kind of the resistance is because it requires them to think differently, to behave differently, to, to perhaps go out of there and do things differently. So, um, and where there is success is that, yes, you have um, your CEO and your board completely committed, have set actual performance measures on their, their management, um, so they're actually ma made accountable to wrap out outcomes. Mm. Yeah, terrific. Yes, would, would, would you like to go to the microphone if you have a question? You have a choice. <laughs> scary at all. Um, I, I want to first thank you, Leah, for your presentation. It's really inspiring to have uh, such a strong First Nations woman as yourself stand up and talk in Parliament House of all places um, and be very honest. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm speaking on today. Uh, 
I work uh, in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade as the manager of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Public Diplomacy Program. And part of that program is that we try to foster greater international understanding of Indigenous peoples, um, both in Australia, obviously, and, and externally. And what I found is um, for, for a lot of Australians, there's very little knowledge and understanding of, of, of our history, of our culture, of what we've been through and how to move forward. Um, and so in some ways, we're no longer preaching to the choir, but preaching to those who need to be converted. Um, what you've noted today is that there's a, a variety of government policies uh, and programs such as the Indigenous Procurement Strategy um, that are certainly innovative and things that we may not have thought about 10 years ago uh, that are making substantive change within communities and actually empowering Indigenous peoples to take this forward. Uh, but without the commitment of not just organisations but the people within them, there is potential, I suppose, for those to, to, to fall at the wayside and to be a, a, a temporary movement. I think what we're invested in is, is having long-term sustainable change and not the revolving door of policy that's happened uh, even since I've been alive. Um, my question to you, I suppose, is obviously with the, uh, the Indigenous uh, procurement strategy being, policy, sorry, being quite an innovative uh, measure, uh, do you think that Australia could should start considering what may 10 years ago have been quite, uh, I suppose, controversial. I, I note that in places like uh, Finland, Norway and our Nordic countries, you have Indigenous parliaments that advise government. In our own backyard, we have New Zealand with parliamentarians uh, and seats inside, uh, set aside for Indigenous peoples. Do you think policies like these, which I suppose you could say positive discrimination policies, should really start to replace and we should start having debates around these uh, as opposed to the deficit model, which we currently kind of sit under. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I think, well, can I, I address your question, is that the affirmative action, or if you look at the Indigenous or supplier diversity movement in the US, which we've actually adopted the IPP from, is an affirmative action policy, which is actually legislated in the US to improve African American, Native American, Hispanics in, as minorities in the US. And it's a policy that's been there for over 40 years. And it has driven great wealth creation in, in those communities in the US. Um, so, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I believe that there are mechanisms like that affirmative action kind of legislations that can drive greater, greater um, um, benefits and impacts. Certainly, um, you know, other mechanisms like the, the, um, the ones, the examples that you've given in terms of having um, strong representative voices in parliament is certainly a, a, a process and something that on the reconciliation movement is one of the areas as we keep going down this journey. And we, we obviously said just in the, the last election, you know, got um, quite a few number of indigenous businesses, uh, indigenous politicians in that. So, I mean, it's more that we can progress down getting more voices in parliament and also having mechanisms outside of parliament where we can have the indigenous voice being strongly um, promoted, I think is, is another mechanism. Yes, a question behind you. Um, I'm a teacher originally, so I'm not involved in all the um, policy and administration side of the universe. Um, but uh, I would be interested to know what Reconciliation Australia um, has in mind or thinks about the process of creating a treaty, uh, knowing that in other parts of the world, treaties do exist. Um, but on the other hand, many of those treaties, like, for example, the Waitangi in New Zealand, were originally uh, enforced upon, in, in, imposed upon the local people by the invading, uh, you know, um, government in effect in, in, back in the 1840s in their case. So the situation in Australia now is very different. If, um, if Arthur Phillip had tried to you know, have a treaty in 1788, uh, at best he would have only ever had it with the Aurora people of the Sydney region. And it's much more complicated than that. And there's the 200 years history in the middle. So is there a process now that we can uh, find that might create a genuine, genuine treaty uh, between people who were here for so many tens of thousands of years before the rest of people like me turned up. Um, is there a way that Reconciliation Australia can see the establishment of a treaty? 
Um, I, I can't actually speak on behalf of Reconciliation in Australia not, no longer being there, but I do know as part of their State of Reconciliation report and sustaining the process that um, they do support an agreement of a process for agreement making between Indigenous peoples and, and, and the governments. So they definitely do support the ongoing discussion and conversation around agreement making or treaties or whatever you want. And in fact, it, it's one of the... Um, I guess, indicators that was presented by the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation in their roadmap to reconciliation, that there, you know, there, there be a process towards agreement and treaty making. So um, they definitely do support the conversation and people should be talking about agreement making or treaties in whatever form they take. Mm. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Hi, thank you so much for coming, Yawa, I should say. I was in Boigu last year, so Hi. very close to my heart. Um, my name's Jackie, I work at the Department of Human Services, more commonly known as Centrelink. Um, so we are, I guess, in a way, the facilitators of the traditional welfare model. Um, I work in the reconciliation space, and um, you're bang on correct. You know, we have our very high level executives on board, and then we have this ground layer of people who are on board and it is that middle layer that we really struggle with to faci facilitate reconciliation in, particularly in the management relationships we find. Um, we have a staffing level of approximately 35,000, so it's a lot, and the majority of our staff are out in the zone. So they're not Canberra based, they are out servicing customers, mm. government services, and um, I guess for me my question is how do we do a better job of making reconciliation action plans less corporate because it is a corporate plan for us and I think that's probably one of the major triggers for people just to be like, no, it's from Canberra, it's corporate. How do we make it more accessible on the ground? Thank you. Yeah. It is a common um, issue that um, where you have the head office, obviously, in the major cities who develop the corporate plan uh, and have the actions, but there is very little awareness and understanding out in the region, so it's not just government agencies, it happens with major corporations as well. I guess the, the successful ones have actually been um, able to kind of uh, break down the wraps in a sense in terms of and then giving responsibilities out in those regions for certain actions and for that, that match that particular region rather than saying, okay, the corporate sees it from the top as a holistic, but actually in your region or where you live and work, how can you make these actions come to life and sort of giving direction and responsibility out to those people in the regions? Mm. One last question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. And that really leads on to my question, which is that, you know, how many of us are here to hear your talk? Um, and I think there really just isn't enough publicity at a very general level about the successes you're having. We have just constantly bam hear of the negative, negative things. And it just seems to me that there is a, a place for more um, discussion on success and, well, in some places, lack of success in the general sort of community. In other, is there some effort being made in that respect? Look, I mean, reconciliation has Australia, you know, their, their foundation of what they try to do is promote the positive to, to, to getting people engaged. And, and, and yes, whilst, you know, we, they, they don't want to sort of um, sugarcoat the bad and, and the areas that need support. But as I said, you know, there is some amazing stuff happening out there. The entrepreneurship that's coming through Indigenous um, people, the numbers of um, graduates out of university, you know, lawyers, doctors, um, you know, they're, 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 and in fact, there's a group called Career Trackers, which provides internships for Indigenous um, students. Um, it's, it's signing up 10 year agreements with Corporate Australia to take hundreds of Indigenous um, university students on because they see that the talent that's coming out of these universities and that Indigenous uh, university students are bringing different perspectives. So, um, and then you've got, you know, other programs in, in um, schools. So it is a difficult thing to get out through 
uh, I guess the the noise of mainstream media, where you know it is all about sort of you know highlighting perhaps you know the the deficit side and the problems. Um, social media is probably the best approach that we that reconciliation has uh, Australia has taken to try and get in good news stories. Uh, they run a program also called the Indigenous Governance Awards, which has been running for oh, probably close to six years, and BHP Billiton funds that, which highlights good governance in Indigenous organisations and how these organisations, against a backdrop of changing government policy, changing programs, um, actually governing quite well um, and incorporating Indigenous um, cultural perspectives in the way they deliver service delivery. Um, but you never get to hear or see those things. And, um, and it's, it, they're doing amazing stuff. It's an ongoing challenge. It's one that you know, we constantly try to highlight the success rather than just continue focusing on the deficit. Thank you, Leah. And, and one thing we can all do, given that this lecture today has been recorded and streamed live and will be available for a, a, a download, you can all go and share the link with 10 friends and spread the word. But sadly, our time today is up. I'd like to thank all of you for coming today, particularly those of you who've come out on a quite a horrid Friday, <laughs> windy, wet and cold. Uh, thank you for your support of, of this uh, program. But most of all, thank you very much to Leah Armstrong for a most inspiring thank address you. today. Thank, thank you. you.